So glad that you could join us for our Easter celebration, our Resurrection Sunday. I, uh, I did a count uh, earlier. I saw that uh, we have like 60 devices connected. I think our highest has been 45. So we're uh, a third greater than we've been before. I, I know we have a few guests. And in, um, in the passage this morning, I'll be sharing from uh, Hebrews chapter 10, which is uh, I've never preached out of this on an uh, Easter Sunday before, but as Pastor Joe and I were doing sermon planning a couple of months ago, uh, before we had the, uh, the pandemic and lock-ins and so on, it's just God's timing, because there are messages from Hebrews 10 that will encourage each of us that are just so appropriate to what we're facing today. As we go, uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. And um, we'll be starting with verse 19. And as we go through this passage, you'll see that Jesus' resurrection guarantees a bold forgiveness and a forever family in him. The resurrection is the guarantee. The, the crucifixion is what purchased these things for us, but the resurrection guarantees that these things are secured, a bold forgiveness, and being in a forever family with him. Hebrews 10, 19, and 20 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, Whenever you see therefore in a passage, you have to ask yourself the question, what is it therefore? And uh, Hebrews 9 and the beginning of chapter 10 has this good discussion about how Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. That the, the high priests and the, those who worked at the altar at the temple, day after day after day would have to offer sacrifices. But Jesus is the perfect ultimate sacrifice. And once his sacrifice was done, there was no longer any need or any efficacy. It wouldn't do any good for them to be other sacrifices. I know that um, there are some churches who, as near as I can tell, sacrifice Jesus every single day. They have a fresh sacrifice. But Hebrews um, 9 and 10 tell us that that's not necessary because he suffered once for all and therefore the sacrifice is done. But there is this reference to the, the Jewish holy places, the, the temple, uh, the temple we usually think of the temple as the, 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 all the temple grounds with the altar of sacrifice and so on. But there was also the, the building inside that, which uh, housed the, uh, the altar of incense, the, um, uh, the showbread, the bread that was placed before the Lord, the, the golden lampstands would always be lit. But then behind that, there was the Holy of Holies. And the, um, the priest would stand before that and offer, you can see the table in front of him is where he's doing the incense. And the, um, uh, um, once a year, he would go behind that curtain to the most holy of places and offer that. But Matthew and Mark tell us that when Jesus was crucified, when he said those last words, when he gave up his spirit, when your redemption and my redemption was accomplished, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Not from the bottom to the top, as someone might do, but from the top to the bottom, as only God could do. Symbolizing that all of us have access to the most holy of places, the presence of God. Whereas before there was a high priest who had to, to mediate, and now we have the opportunity to go in directly ourselves into God's presence. We can boldly go in. That word boldly has the idea of speaking whatever is on your mind. I love the fact that little kids, they'll come up and they'll just say whatever they want to say. 
Park Linkletter had a segment called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Um, and kids will do that. They're bold. They, they have this confident relationship with mom and dad, and they can just say it. You, having trusted in Jesus, can have that confident relationship, that boldness to enter into his presence and to say whatever the Holy Spirit lays on your heart, knowing that God will accept it. That, that tearing of the, the veil in the temple opened a new and living way. Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus didn't say, I'm a way. He is the way. He didn't say he was a truth. He said he's the truth. He didn't say he was a way to get to life. He said he is the life that he shares. Everyone comes to that living way, that living savior. Without the resurrection, we would have a dead teacher. We would have a sad sacrifice. But now we have a living way. And everyone can come to the Father through him. Hebrews 10 goes on to say in verses 21 and 22, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. As we mentioned before, the high priest would do those, those uh, sacrifices. He would go into the Holy of Holies once a year. The priests, the other priests, daily they would offer sacrifices for sin. They would offer opportunities for fellowship with God. They would be an intermediary between the, the person wanting to offer something to God and God himself. The priest would be that. But we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ. And he's over the entire house of God. Now that house of God is, is God's people. That, that's you. You are the house of God. The, the building that we sometimes call the house of God at 4317 County Road 46 sits empty this morning. The lights are off. The heat is off. No one is stirring, except for a few church mice. We're, John Eiler, our, our, our custodian, is working on those, but empty, empty. But the house of God is not empty. The house of God is gathered in front of all these screens and on these telephones. The house of God in all of these churches around the country. You've heard of some churches uh, having services in a parking lot or a movie theater. Many, many churches are live streaming. They're right now watching their pastor share the good news of Jesus Christ, the celebration of the resurrection. The house of God is open for business because you are his children. You are the house of God. We have that great high priest who makes it possible for us to be the house of God. So since we have that, high, that great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Our hearts are true. There's, there's nothing secret or hidden. It's totally revealed before God and before us. We have this full confidence of faith. We don't have to wonder, is it possible to go to him? Is it possible to find forgiveness? Is it possible to have fellowship with the creator of the universe? You can have that full, unmixed, total assurance of trusting in him. Earlier in Hebrews, uh, the writer was, in Hebrews chapter 4, the writer was talking about that confidence that we have. And he expressed it this way there in Hebrews 4.16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we find, may find mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's so important to be able to approach that throne, isn't it? That, that you can find mercy. God does not treat you as your sins deserve. God does not treat you as a fallen person. 
God does not treat you as one who has disappointed him again and again and again. You can be confident that you will receive mercy, that you will receive grace, his riches, his abundance, his, his giving to you what you need, not necessarily everything you want, but confidence that you find what you need in your time of need. Maybe this lockdown has been a time of need. Maybe this, uh, some of you are out there fighting the fight, uh, providing vital services to those in the medical community uh, for your patients. Some of you are out there doing those jobs that the public uh, comes into. Some of you are, are finding that need. Some of you are bored out of your skulls. Some of you are homeschooling in ways that you never thought you'd have to do before. Whatever your need is, you can, with confidence, boldly approach the throne of grace, finding mercy, finding that grace in all of your needs. The passage also says, verse 22 had said, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Again, there's a couple of sacrificial pictures mentioned here. The sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. The, the sprinkling. Uh, we, we really can't, I mean, this is Resurrection Sunday, but we do need to talk about the sacrifice that was done on Friday. You see, that sprinkling is, an, is a, a, an allusion to sacrifice. You see, in sacrifice, the animal would have to shed his life. This is a fairly graphic picture where the, the blood of the sacrifice is then sprinkled on, on the, uh, those who are being cleansed. You see, there, the animal had to give its very life. And that blood is sprinkled on the recipient saying, that payment has been done for you. The payment of Jesus Christ has been done. This is kind of gross, and we're so glad we're not involved in the sacrificial system, but I guarantee you it was gross when Jesus was on the cross. It was awful when his blood was spilled. And you and I are sprinkled with that blood in a full, full assurance that we are cleansed. Our conscience is cleansed. And also our bodies are washed with water. That you can't help but think of baptism. Uh, yes, I much prefer baptism than the sprinkling of blood. I'm glad we don't do that. But Jesus' blood was sprinkled on our consciences, on where we make those decisions. And our bodies were washed. You, you certainly recognize that baptism is a picture of the Holy Spirit cleansing. It is a picture of us dying to sin and being buried being raised again by the power of the Spirit, being cleansed by his, uh, his, Holy, his Holy Spirit to give us a newness of life. It is a celebration. This is Resurrection Sunday. Every baptism is a resurrection. Every baptism is a celebration of what Jesus has done. Every baptism is a reminder that the Holy Spirit has cleansed us. And we did need it to be cleansed. We did need to have that brutal sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 reminds us that, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither be the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That 1 Corinthians 6, 8 through 10 is, is bad news because we know that we have failed. Now, now your particular sin may not be on that list, um, but I'm pretty sure that some shade of your sin might be found there. The bad news was that we're all in that condition. The, the passage goes on to say that in, in verse 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ 
and by the Spirit of our God. What tremendous liberty, what incredible joy that we were washed, we were set apart by God. You were justified. You were, you were treated, I, I love that expression, just as if I never sinned. God looks at you not seeing your sin, not seeing your fallenness, not seeing your brokenness. But if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've asked for forgiveness for those sins, if you've invited him to be the Lord of your life, then you are as if you had never sinned. When you stand before the throne of grace, you won't stand there as, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I hope you'll let me in. It'll be Jesus putting his arm around you and saying, he or she can come in because I've made them pure. I've washed them with my Holy Spirit. What a tremendous truth. What an incredible Savior. Verse 23 of Hebrews 10 goes on to say, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. That word hold fast has the idea of, uh, of nailing it down. Um, it's, it's done. We have this, this hope. Now that, that hope is not a, a pie in the sky, maybe someday good things will happen. That hope is a confidence. I was thinking this morning, I have a hope of an Easter basket from Kathy. I have seen the basket. I am ready for that chocolate cross that she put in the basket. I have confidence in my hope. Have you seen that the Lord has an eternity prepared for you? Are you confident that you're, you have a an expectation of being with him. Have that hope without wavering. That wavering is the idea of just kind of, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll lean in this direction or maybe I'll go with that. I'm just kind of moving back and forth. I, it's nailed down without wavering because he who has promised is faithful. Jesus suffered a brutal death on the cross. But the resurrection reminds us that God is faithful. He raised Jesus from the dead. He brought him out of that tomb. I don't know about you, but sometimes I reflect that I want to be faithful. I try to do the right thing. I countlessly disappoint the Lord. But he is faithful. It doesn't depend on my faithfulness. It depends on his faithfulness. I can hold fast and be faithful because he has made that promise solid. Hebrews 10, 24 goes on to say, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Because of God's faithfulness, because of all that he's done, because of Resurrection Sunday, we ought to think about how we can stir one another to love and good works. That word stir up is a, an idea of, a, of provoke. It's a very active word. It's not just suggest. It, it, it can mean to incite. In some uh, passages in the New Testament, it's, it's a confrontation, inciting crowds to riot. That's an interesting picture, isn't it? Rather than, uh, you want a piece of this? You want to you come at me? It's you want to do this? You want to follow Jesus? You want to love him more? We're, we're kickstarting each other. Not kicking each other, but you get the idea. We're, we're helping each other in a strenuous way. We're stirring up one another to love and good works. To love. Can you stir someone up to love? Yeah. Because as we talk to each other, as we share with each other, we share that love in two ways. One would be the, the love that you have for the Father, the love that you have for Jesus, the love that the Holy Spirit brings through you. Isn't God a great God? Isn't he incredible? Listen to the song that I've heard. Doesn't that, doesn't that remind you of God's grace and his love? Oh, I'm so in love with him. Aren't you in love with him? Love him more. 
but also we we have love for each other. You know, this this church member, they're hurting. Let's let's go. Okay, we can't go over, we can't visit right now, but let's give them a call. Let's drop them a note. Let's send them an email. Maybe put a little gift on the porch. Yeah, let, let's show love that way. We we stir up one another to do love. And sometimes that love is. I have to tell you that you hurt me. I have to tell you that, that I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm disappointed. I love you and I don't want this to come between us. I don't want there to be an argument. We, we confront gently in love, but we do confront to restore those relationships that are so vital in Jesus Christ. And also those good works. We mentioned some good works about helping our brothers and sisters, but uh, I, I'm so encouraged by, by Pastor Joe as, as we have met most telephonically, <laughs> as we have met, uh, we do Zoom meetings practically all day, every day on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Um, Pastor Joe is always thinking about how can the church be the church? How can the church stir up that gift within them? I'm, I'm encouraged. A number of you have dropped off things for the food pantry, and uh, we've been making a delivery this week. And you can keep uh, dropping that off in the in the blue tote in front of church. The um, uh, and some of you are are doing what you can where you can, uh, making masks, uh, helping with the postage of those masks. We stir one another up. That being the church is not just sitting there. On your couch or in the pew but it is it is doing the things that honor God the passage goes on to say that not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another the um, I, I find it ironic that we, we plan this Hebrews 10 passage um, weeks ago before we were all locked in, but here it says, we well, shouldn't neglect to meet together. But you know, we're doing that. We're meeting together. I don't mean to embarrass anybody whose picture shows here, but um, we are the church gathered together. And I love the fact that, that people turn on their cameras and they, they wave and they say, hello, how you doing? And, uh, and, and talk to the kids. You know, it's, it's being the church. It's encouraging one another. In the Alpha group, the, uh, the class for people who are new to New Covenant, or new to Bible study, um, we talk about when we go over the church covenant, an important piece of the church covenant is supporting its worship. I call it the ministry of just showing up. Um, you perform a vital ministry just by being there. You see someone in the hall, you say, hello, how are you doing? And you actually listen to how they're doing. And you ask them about something that they shared as a prayer request in your small group the week before. And they see you Sunday by Sunday being there or being on Zoom. And they know that you're faithful. And that encourages them to be faithful. It encourages them to to help each other. I love the first, the first line of uh, the Purpose Driven Life uh, says, it's not about you. Uh, sometimes I, I must confess, I, I get disappointed when people say, uh, it's what I get out of church. I go to a church where I can be fed and I can grow. I'd much rather hear, I go to a church where God can use me. I go to a church where I know I'm blessing other people. Yes, it's important to be fed. It's important to grow personally. But one way you can tell that you're being fed and know that you're growing personally is that you're, you're encouraging other people. You're being used by God in the body life. That word encouraging, I, I looked it up because, you know me, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a high I and I love to encourage people and build them up. I'm a cheerleader. Um, but that word encouraging is in the Greek parakaleo, which is what the Holy Spirit does. He's the paraclete. 
you are being used by the Holy Spirit to build up other people, to encourage them, to, to stir them up, to move them on. The Holy Spirit works through you in the lives of others. And the Holy Spirit works in them to build you up. And it's so important that we all meet together to glorify God in that way. I'm so glad we're meeting together as best we can. It does say not neglecting to meet together is a habit of some, but encouraging one another. All the more as you see the day drawing near. Well, that's fascinating. Part of your motivation for being the body, for investing in other people, is that the day is drawing near. You see, Jesus rising from the dead is a clear guarantee that there will come a day when we all rise from the dead, when those who have gone before us rise, when those of us who remain go up with them together in the air, Oh, that's going to be such a resurrection day. And that day is every day that dawns is another day closer to that day. We don't know when it is. Some people have asked you, do you think that this might be the, the final pestilence? Do you think this might be an indication that, that, that God is drawing near? And the answer would be, of course he's drawing near. Every single thing, single thing that happens moves us closer and closer. To that day. I am so looking forward to that day. Peter in his second letter to the churches in 2 Peter 3.11 says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? All this is temporary. Every single thing that we appreciate and enjoy is temporary. And how should we then live? You should live lives of holiness, set apart to God, marked for a purpose, for his purposes, and godliness, being shaped by the Holy Spirit who not only washes you, but shapes you into the image of Jesus Christ. So the world might see what God is like. The Apostle Paul said that you are letters you are letters written to the world of what God is like and what he desires. So on your road to resurrection, because we're all on that road, right? How are you treasuring your risen Savior? Today is a very special day. Today is an incredible day of rejoicing, and I hope you do so. Uh, I know as Pastor Joe is wearing a tie, I'm wearing my Easter egg tie. It's, um, it's just a way of celebrating that Jesus is, is amazing. But every single day, treasuring who he is and what he's like, that he has purchased all these things for you. He's done all this for you. And how often do you boldly seek forgiveness? I, I, I think there's some of this attitude in the Christian life that says, Jesus forgave all my sins, and then it was up to me to do the right thing from then on. But 1 John 1, 1, uh, yes, 1 John 1, 9 and 10 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He did that through his sacrificial death on the cross. He did that, he guaranteed it by his resurrection. You got it. You've got that opportunity to find forgiveness every single time, go to him. And how are you encouraging your brothers and sisters in Christ? Um, I, I've been so encouraged by the number of people who've shared that they're praying for me, uh, by the, the getting together with people through Zoom. <laughs> Just the, the notes that people have sent. How are you encouraging your brothers and sisters? How are you connecting with them? A few weeks ago, I talked to someone who said, I'm just lonely. I'm just by myself. I'm not connecting with other people. It's so frustrating. And I suggested, why don't you call them? 
why don't you reach out to them? Because they're probably lonely and they'd like somebody to talk to. And once this lockdown is done, how we make those opportunities to encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to, uh, to finish this with a, um, a video. I know we're, we're doing multiple songs this week, but it's Easter, it's Resurrection Sunday. We can celebrate a lot. I came across this this week and it was just so encouraging to me um, because it talks about how incredible Jesus is, that he is worthy, that he is amazing, that there will be a day. Revelation chapter five is my favorite book in the entire Bible, my favorite chapter. I just love it when it talks about Jesus. I'm gonna leave this with you and then after the song is over, uh, Pastor Joe will wrap things up. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you that Jesus has overcome. I thank you that you gave your life for me You've cleansed me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for those who, who are lacking confidence right now, who are not sure of where they stand. Lord, help them to turn to you and to make sure on this Easter Sunday, on this resurrection day. Lord, I pray for those who, who have trusted in you. Help them to keep trusting in you, knowing that they can talk boldly to you because you are their daddy. Lord, may you be glorified at all times and we glorify you in your body, in your church, through Jesus. Amen.